Hi, I'm Corey Haynes. This is a recorded kata cast with commentary of the Roman numerals kata. The task here is to write a routine which will convert Arabic numbers to Roman numerals. Pretty straightforward. The real benefit of these kata is not when you solve the problem, but instead in the way you solve the problem. By practicing the solution many times, you can start to analyze the more subtle parts of your practice, looking at not just how you do it, but the why behind each step as well. In this screencast, I'll be walking you through my solution, stopping regularly to discuss the small decisions that I made along the way. It very well could seem like nitpicking at each step, and in a way it is. But by practicing the very small thoughts behind these decisions in a constrained environment such as this one, we won't have to think about them as much when we are coding for our production work. Enjoy! My first example is the degenerate case. This corresponds in a way to the nothing to nil transformation from the transformation priority premise. Right now I don't have anything. By focusing on the nothing case I can get my initial structure set up. So I can set up how to test what the method name is, what the parameter, and in TDD, we focus on a very tight feedback loop. So we like to run our tests as often as possible. I know I'm going to fail here, but I still want to run the test. And I get what I expect, which is undefined method convert. In getting this to pass, notice I don't bother with another file. When working on a small routine like this, I prefer to have everything as close together as possible. Also, if this was for a production system, I'd probably be deferring the decision about where to put it. I do make a slightly larger leap here in that I include the parameter when I make the method. If I was taking absolutely baby steps, I'd just focus on making that undefined method message change and then let a test message give me that the parameter isn't there. I'm confident in this one though. Now, I run my tests again after building the method because I want to see an actual test failure. That is an expectation failure. So here we have an expected empty string got nil. That's more of what the test is saying. Now, following the transformation priority premise, nil to constant is a simple choice for getting this test to pass. So let's return a blank string constant. And we're passing. So my second example is the one that brings variation to my system after setting up the structure with a degenerate case. According to the transformation priority premise, or TPP, a constant is a very simple test to move to. We can move to our first real rule-based case, which is 1. Of course, this is going to fail since all we have built so far is the simple blank string. As we move forward, getting subsequent examples to pass, we want to make sure not to have previous examples start failing. If they do, then we are probably taking either too large of steps or we aren't choosing the correct sequence of tests. A very simple transformation is the if clause or guard clause. I use this a lot as a technique to sort of wall off the previous code and give myself a fresh base to work from. Also notice that the first failure we got was a bad value. We expected an I but we got the empty string while the failure after the guard clause takes us back to nil, expected i got nil. Now nil to constant is a wonderfully simple transformation according to TPP. We can then enact that transformation to get this example passing. Ta-da! Now, up till now it has been pretty straightforward. Here is the first decision. What's the next test? A lot of implementations that I see use 2 as the next test. However, if we think about complexity, 2 is actually quite complex. It could almost be considered a vector or array of 1s. The TPP talks about this, so I'm going to choose an example that might be considered simply a more complex constant, 5. Another interesting thing here is the fact that I can create this test by a simple copy and search and replace. This accentuates the fact that the test for 5 is a constant, just like 1. This will influence the next step we see. 
So running the test, we see we expected V, but we got I. This is similar to when we were getting the one case passing. I want to reset my test so that I can move from nil instead of from the constant related to the previous example. And of course, guard clause to the rescue. Now we are back to an expectation failure around nil, so we can use the nil to constant transformation to get this passing. Ta-da! Now, the fact that I could do a straight copy of 1 to 5 and i to v shows me that there is some duplication here. The duplication isn't really in the test case as much as the knowledge about testing the rules. So, when talking about design, I fall back to the four rules of simple design. In this case, we can see duplication around how to test, so I'm going to eliminate that duplication right away. This allows us to extract out the what we are testing from the how we are testing it, really drawing our attention to the rules of the algorithm, rather than having to look through unnecessary noise to see them. Whenever we do a refactoring, it's worth running our test to make sure that we're still passing. Then I can delete the old ones. It's worth noting that I don't wrap the zero case into this. For me, the zero is a case that stands outside of the standard rules. It is an exceptional situation, and I want to highlight it separately. Now it is time to move up the complexity a bit. We've seen a simple constant, a slightly more complex constant. Now let's move to something much more complicated, the two. Two can be thought of as a vector or array of ones. According to the TPP, this is much more complex than a simple constant or even a scalar. We're going to get this passing with our usual technique of guard clause plus returning a constant. Then we'll move into the refactoring stage, which is where the real excitement of this algorithm comes into play. Now there's a bit of subtle duplication here, and this is going to lead us to the actual algorithm that does the conversion. The ii is actually made of two parts, just like 2 is. The second i can be considered the same as converting the one. The first I is really there because we are more than one, that is two, and the one is actually what is left when we remove the first part of the two. It's a bit complicated to say, but I hope you can see. Now, we're going to use this technique a couple times through this refactoring, which is adding code and making the algorithm slightly more, or in this case much more, complex. This is a temporary situation in order to drive out some explicit duplication that we can eliminate. This change has highlighted a pretty clear piece of duplication. Namely, on line 3, the hard-coded return i of in Arabic equals 1, contains the same knowledge as what we just wrote on line 5, since 1 minus 1 is 0 and the recursive call will yield an empty string. So shifting the code the way we did allows us to delete line 3. I'd like to take a moment to point out that at each small incremental change, we are rerunning our tests and verifying they are still green. This has a couple benefits. One, we can see that we truly aren't changing any behavior. And two, if we make a mistake, we can just undo our last change. When refactoring, we should be keeping our test green at each incremental step. The I and the 1 on line 4 are really effectively representations of the same thing. Perhaps we could think them of them as conversion factors. It makes sense to group them into a single entity there. Here we fall back on a technique we've seen before, introducing duplication in order to coax the algorithm towards a simpler form. Line 4, where we are specifying the conversion factor, 
is the same idea as line 3, just in a different format. Line 3 is saying that 5 goes to V, and line 4 says that 1 goes to I. The ordering is important, of course, which is why the guard clause for 5 comes first. We can highlight this duplication of style of looking up conversion factor, if you will, by adding code to our new conversion factor technique on line 4. We'll have to be careful to put the 5 in the right place and grab it when appropriate. That's why we use the less than or equals, because we want to find the 5 when we have 5, but the 1 when we have 2 or 1. Just as a side note, I'm using an underscore in my predicate to find the conversion factors to accentuate the fact that the lookup isn't dependent on the second part of the array, that is, the Roman equivalent. Now, seeing this pass, we can eliminate the duplication we just added by deleting line 3. Now we have a working algorithm, but our design isn't done. Applying the four rules of simple design, I'm going to call a huge violation here of revealing intention. It is a very compact method, and I can see that it is looking up in the array. However, this method is crossing abstraction layers. One of the guiding principles I use when reviewing my code for doneness is whether the methods really stay at a consistent level of abstraction. This one doesn't. It is responsible for doing the conversion, but it also drops down into actually looking up what the conversion factors are. So let's do a simple extract method to give ourselves a nice named abstraction for what we're doing. This new method is focused on looking up the conversion factors. That's pretty nice. But we have this ugly naked array that I'd like to give a name to. I'd like to separate out the responsibility of looking up the conversion factors from the task of creating the factors themselves. Let's extract this into a constant. At this point, we have our algorithm. We don't have the program complete. We're still missing some rules, but the TDD, the design aspect, is fairly complete. Instead, now I'm going to focus on writing verification tests to drive out the missing requirements, namely the rest of the conversion factors. I like to keep my tests in numerical order, so I'm going to move that 2 up. Now let's move to the next conversion that is part of the rules, 4. We can put it in our example list. Don't forget to see the test fail. And then easily add it up into our conversion factor list now. Once passing, I'm going to move it up into its numerical place. In some implementations that I've seen, there's a lot of effort put in to calculating the 4, the IV, and thus the 9, the 40, the 90 as offsets. However, I think that adds complexity to the algorithm and also, perhaps more importantly, hides an important aspect of the Roman numeral counting system. By keeping the 4, the 9, the 40 offsets in our conversion chart, we provide a very clear documentation of how Roman numerals look. Now, since we are moving now to verification-oriented tests, I want to make sure that the important parts, the conversion list and the example list, are readily accessible. Adding more conversions is going to drop the example list down the page, forcing me to scroll back and forth. So, I'm going to do a quick split window so I can easily pop back and forth between the two lists and keep them in sight. So the first verification test before I move into just implementing the straight conversions is a slightly more complex vector than two. In this case I'm using a six. I want to make sure that the recursion and the lookup work well together when I'm converting 
two different types of numbers. The 6 will be both an i and a v. I expect this to pass right out of the gate. And it does. The rest of the kata is just jumping back and forth, adding tests for each of the individual conversion factors from 10 up to 1,000. Let's speed this up a little bit since it isn't the most exciting and there isn't a lot to say about it. And also it makes it look like I type really fast. As we come to the end, I want to put a final verification for a number that uses a quite a few of the conversions, just for good measure. In this case, we'll do 3497. Counting it out. And sure enough, it passes, and we're done. I hope you enjoyed this kata cast with commentary. One of the beauties of practicing a kata like this is that you can take time to focus on the very small details, the decisions you make at each step of the way. By practicing them repeatedly in an environment such as a kata, you make the thoughts and ideas your own, so you won't have to think quite so much about them when you are writing production code. When you're doing that, you need to be a bit more efficient and not think about every single step of the way. Well, happy coding!